Warning. This program may contain material of an explicit or graphic nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Casting Undead from the B-Ward, this is the Postmortem Show. I'm Don. And I'm JD. And today, inspired by our listener Eileen, who gifted us the horror game Soma through Seam, we're going to give you the top five horror video games. Yeah. It's a fun list. It was. I love horror yeah. video Especially games. since I've just recently got back into, into playing a little bit more. That's my go-to. It's either horror video games or hockey. Or beating off. Well, that's not a video game. Not yet. <laughs> oh, you mean video? Okay, I thought you just meant life in general. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, yeah, Eileen sent uh, Soma over to my Steam account. I have started playing it. It's pretty cool. I got a little stuck at one point, so I took a little break for my own sanity. But uh, yeah, definitely a cool game. So you guys check that out, Soma on Steam. It's pretty cheap, too. I think it's only like fourteen ninety nine or nice. something like that. It's one of the cheaper games. It's, it's not a $60 game. Made by the people who made Amnesia Dark Descent, and that's a great game, too. So. Yeah. They, they do psychological horror very well. I, I need to get a, a PC desktop because I'm a, I'm a Mac guy so I can play games again. Yeah, in addition to the top five horror games, we have an interview with actor Nathan Basil. Fuck yeah. Leslie Vernon himself. Himself. He's coming on the show to promote our upcoming live show. And uh, we hope to see you guys all there. I don't care where the fuck you live. you got to get here for this. Yeah, because this is the place that it's happening. This isn't something that's going on tour. Like, <laughs> yeah. like when this show, when this event happens... This is where it's happening. Yeah, he's he's not going to come to fucking Seattle. He's not going to come to Los Angeles. He's not going to come to Houston, Texas, or fucking Georgia, or wherever the hell you're from. Yeah, he's coming to a Tascadero. He's coming to a Tascadero, the mecca of horror. Which is weird to say, but <laughs> fucking Danny Danny Foster is a wizard. Look at his beard. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, he's a magnificent wizard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a as a fan of fine facial hair, I, I, I would say that Danny Foster has one of the more majestic beards I've seen, and he uses it for the good cause of horror. <laughs> <laughs> he does. The event's going to be a lot of fun. You'll hear the commercial for it later, so we're not going to get too much into it right now. What we are going to get into before we get to Leslie Vernon and the top five horror video games, we're going to get into some horror news. Horror news. I think Majestic Danny Foster Beard should be our rating system. <laughs> <laughs> Majestic Danny Foster Beard. Here we go. For years, there's been rumors about the possibility of a much more violent and graphic director's cut of one of our favorite movies. Event Horizon. Yep. And a much gruesome and bloodier cut was initially shown to test audiences who were repulsed by the graphic scenes. Some audience members even fainted. Barfed in their popcorn buckets. Yeah. Par- Paramount. Pop- popcorn barf stew. <laughs> Paramount agreed and commissioned the new cut, which is the version we know and love. There were also deleted scenes on the backstory for Cooper and Justin and a backstory for Miller explaining what the Hellgate actually was, and a much longer version of the Visions of Hell scene and the tape of the previous crew. Director Paul W.S. Anderson has confirmed we will never get this release because they don't have the footage. It doesn't exist anymore. <sighs> he said it was before the era of, the era of uh, DVD extras where deleted scenes and extras were archived for bonus features to get people to buy the DVD. Yep. This was back in the VHS days, so Paramount destroyed the footage. Assholes, and we're never going to see those extra scenes for Event Horizon. Damn, he should he should make another movie, not not another, maybe even a, an Event Horizon sequel. It could be a sequel. Yeah, it totally needs a sequel, and, and, and make it that brutal. I, th- I think it was on our movies that needed yeah, a sequel. It was, yeah, yeah. I think we both had we ideas both had for it. it. Yeah. yeah, mine not a serious <laughs> <laughs> Event Horizon Two, Space Cox, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. You guys might enjoy. For a new listener, go back and listen to that Movies That Need a Sequel episode. That was a good one. Yeah. 
What you got this week? Netflix and the Jim Henson Company are teaming up to bring a prequel to The Dark Crystal. Entitled Dark Crystal, The Age of Resistance, the show will tell the story of the Skeksis rise to power and the Gelflings who rose up against them. A teaser announcement featuring concept art for the show has been released to various video platforms, and the show is in pre-production now with no release date. The only thing they haven't mentioned, and this is my greatest fear, is whether or not it's going to be puppets or CG. Uh Uh-oh. If it's puppets, I'm excited as fuck. Yeah. If it's CG, I may not even watch it. Yeah. CG, man. Because, like, The Dark Crystal, it's not a horror movie, but it's creepy as fuck. It is. And it's one of the early creepy movies that I ever remember seeing, and so it's kind of burned into my psyche. Yeah. Like, that whole, that whole like, aesthetic that it has. Yep. And good good uh, drunken skeletons and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that, that creepiness will not translate into CG. I don't care how hard you try. Yeah. The puppets and the way the puppets moved, like, the sort of jerkiness of the motions and all that, all that really, like, made it. Yeah. And so, with the Henson Company involved, that's a good sign that there's going to be puppets. And with Mystery Science Theater 3000 working out so well... And that being a show with puppets, I'm I'm certain that they're at least having some level of comfort going in that direction. But uh, I will be following this story as it progresses, and we will see. We will get back with some more puppet news. Puppet news. We'll do some <laughs> puppet news. <laughs> <laughs> Cookie. Speaking of puppets, <laughs> meat puppets, Hollywood heartthrob, Zach Efron. Oh, yeah, there's a meat puppet. He went to my high school. Really? Yeah. The uh, the drummer in my high school band, his mom is an agent, and she was Jack, Zac Efron's first agent. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. He's set to play Ted Bundy in yeah. the upcoming movie, Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile. Documentary, duh, documentarian and director of Book of Shadows, Blair Witch 2, Joe Berlinger, is set to direct. Okay. So he's made a bunch of documentaries, yeah. including Paradise Lost 3. Yeah, and that was a good one. Blair Witch 2, Book of Shadows, not so good. I, I, I forgive it, Blair Witch 2 for what it is. I, if you watch that and compare it to a lot of the other movies that were coming out during that time period, it's way better. He probably knows a lot about Ted Bundy, though, since he's a documentarian. Yeah. And coming back for a feature film yeah. after doing a bunch of documentaries, it's got a big budget because Zac Efron's in it, right? right? So I'm hoping it's going to be pretty good. It's told from the perspective of Elizabeth Klipfer, who is Bundy's longtime girlfriend. She went years denying the accusations, but ultimately turned him into police. Wow. Uh, you know, Zac Efron, you know, he started out doing fucking, you know, whatever his bullshit musical thing that he was doing was. Meat puppets. Yeah. Musical. Yeah. Me, me, <laughs> I'd, I'd watch that one, actually. But uh, he's kind of showing that he's got some chops, like, with the comedy stuff that he's doing now. Like, that Baywatch movie that he did with The Rock actually looks like it's going to be funny. Wow. Um so we'll see. I mean, if he can do this and pull it off, it could be this could be like John Travolta and fucking Pulp Fiction, you know, like just a total reset of the career. Yeah. Uh, Hasselhoff Meat Puppets is a better breed system. Hasselhoff Meat. It is. It is. Yeah. Sorry, Danny. You've been you've been ousted. The beard can stay, but you gotta go. Bearded Hasselhoff Meat Puppets. Beard. Bearded Hasselhoff sounds like a vagina euphemism. I'm going to stick it in your bearded Hasselhoff. <laughs> Let's just go with bearded Hasselhoff. <laughs> <laughs> stick my meat puppet in your bearded Hasselhoff. What else you got this week? Jordan Peele and J.J. Abrams have signed on to produce Lovecraft Country, a horror drama for HBO. The show is based on a novel by Matt Ruff, set in the 1950s, and tells the story of a young black army veteran, his uncle and friend, who traveled through New England to find a missing estranged relative. The uh, show will deal with the racism of the Jim Crow era, along with occult themes and Lovecraftian horror. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this fucker. When yeah. you told me you had it for news, I was like, damn it, because I wanted to talk about it. And here we are. Yeah, here we are. Anyway, talking <laughs> about it. Jordan Peele, he killed it with Get Out. He slayed so. it. And if this, if this is going to be race horror, like like it seems like it's going to be. Because yeah. what, from what I've read on it, it looks like the dude's, I think it's his dad, gets kidnapped by the KKK, but it turns out that the KKK is a great old one cult. <laughs> really? Yeah, that it, it's a book, and and so that's kind of what I've never read the book. I might go get it, but that's what I've kind of gathered from what I've read about it. Lovecraft himself is race horror. Yeah, famous famous closet racist. Fa- famous race. I mean, wasn't he? I don't know. So to say he was closet, but I, I think that would also be a good way to touch on because, like, a lot of people say that like people shouldn't read Lovecraft because it's so racist, but like, 
it's a snapshot of its time, and it's not like a Civil War memorial that, like, you know, we, we put up this fucking Confederate memorial to celebrate these racists of history. Yeah. Like, you read it as, as a framing mechanism for the rest of what's going on in the story. Yep. So if this is willing to approach that and actually have, like, a, a, a discourse about it, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, especially George Bill being involved. You yeah. know he did it right for Get Out. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about that? Nope. Excited for it. Something I'm excited for, in addition to that, The Shining is coming to this year's Halloween Horror Nights at both Universal Studios Hollywood and Orlando. Wow. Soon you will get a chance to be a guest at the infamous Overlook Hotel. There will be a recreation of scenes from the film as well as peeks into the murder and madness that took place at the Overlook Hotel prior to the arrival of the Torrance family. I am hoping they include the appearance of inappropriate sex act bear. And uh, giant bush bathtub woman. Yeah, giant bush bathtub woman. Inappropriate sex act there, though. That's important. Yeah. There, there, there's a lot of symbolism behind He's that. He's my buddy. Yeah. <laughs> your, your fuzzy buddy. My fuzzy buddy, inappropriate sex act bear. <laughs> he should just have his own spinoff movie. It sounds, yeah, he should. It, it, inappropriate sex act bear, when you say it like that, it sounds like either like an infomercial or like a toy. Like, yeah, like a South Park character <laughs> yeah, or something. Inappropriate sex act bear, now with <laughs> kung fu punching action. <laughs> kung fu fisting action and, <laughs> and realistic rubber ball gag. <laughs> Yeah, if I, I went to Universal Studios Halloween Horror Nights last year for my bachelor party for the first time, and it was pretty awesome. Yeah, so. they put a lot of good work into it. Yeah. I wonder if they're bringing that out to like celebrate the anniversary of The Shining, or if they're doing some sort of release to go along with it, because usually they're trying to promote like a movie. Yeah, but they that. had like Exorcist last time, and That's a bunch true. of older movies. They had Texas Chainsaw, they had, you know. Yeah. They just are having the budget to have good stuff. Now, right. I think. Stuff that will draw people like us there instead of just random bullshit. Right. Clowns are chasing me. Oh no. <laughs> Everywhere I go, in the outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> so Javier Bardem is in discussion with Universal to play Frankenstein's monster in their Universal Horror Cineverse they're putting together. The plan is to have him appear as the monster in another movie before breaking off into his first standalone, which will likely be Bride of Frankenstein. Bardem was quoted as saying, I have the size of the head and they're not going to have to waste a whole lot of money on makeup, that's for sure. <laughs> Bardem was originally pro- uh, approached to play Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a role that eventually went to Russell Crowe, who will be appearing as the character in a cameo in the upcoming Mummy film, but Bardem turned that role down because he wanted to play the monster when that role became available. That's awesome. And you know, they're tying all these new Universal movies together. Mm-hmm. There's a film that has Russell Crowe um, as Dr. Jekyll. Mm-hmm. And he has a formaldehyde jar, and in it is the fin from the creature from the Black Lagoon. Yep. And apparently Tom Cruise's character in The Mummy is going to be sort of like the Van Helsing of the entire series. It kind of is, is the monster hunter that goes through it. So. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> all, all of it's linked. You know, I, I hate Tom Cruise. I'm not going to say I hate him. Tom, He's a shitty person. Tom but Cruise a is a shitty person. But almost every movie he's in, I'm like, fuck, I like this movie. Yeah. yeah he's a good actor. But, yeah. he, he, I, I like... Scientology. Begru- begrudgingly like his movies. Like, <laughs> fuck! I was waiting for this one to suck. Why do you keep making good things? Even War of the Worlds was entertaining, except for that little kid. <laughs> I loved it. I like the little kid. I think she did good. Yeah. You know, she reminds me of Kaylee. Like, yeah. how, how she's so weird with, like, the way she dresses. Yeah, like, yeah, that's true. She did a lot of Kaylee in her. So. Yeah. All right, that's it for horror news. We'll be back with your very own inappropriate sex act bear, Dom and JD. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> <laughs> inappropriate sex act bear. <laughs> Coming back with the good movie and the bad movie. And a jar of Vaseline. A jar of Vaseline. An interview with Leslie Vernon. <laughs> <laughs> In the top five horror video games after this. Hi, thanks for listening to the Postmortem Podcast. If you want to support us, go to our website at www.postmortemshow.com and click the Amazon link. By clicking on the Amazon banner, Amazon will give a small percentage of the purchase price of your item back to the Postmortem Podcast at no additional cost to you. That's right. It doesn't cost you any money. We get money. You want us to keep doing this? You want more Doug Jones talk? You want more dick and fart talk? I don't care. We're going to do it. Fund our filthy, filthy habits. Yes, and they are many and they are fast. And most of them aren't legal. (laughs) Yes. Click the banner. Just do it. Come on, don't be a dick. Give us money. 
It's time for the good movie. And the bad movie. That's right, we're back, and this week Dom has a stinker. Fuck. I suffered this week. I suffered through the five minutes, the yeah. opening five minutes or so, and then I said, Dom, we were going to do after movies yeah. this week. And I said, Dom, we're going to do good movie and bad movie, because you watched that fucker, and I'm yeah. not watching it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Michelle watched it with me, so uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's how I know she really loves me. <laughs> Before we get to that steaming turd, we'll go with my bad movie first. All right. Which isn't as bad, but you be the judge if you guys want to watch it. So, 2017, written and directed by Brady Hall. A little movie called Seven Witches. Have you heard of this? Nope. IMDb synopsis simply states, a horror film set at a wedding. That's all it says. And they intentionally didn't release a lot of information about this movie. Huh. Which is pretty weird, huh? Yeah. But, uh, I don't know why. Maybe to try to get you to watch it. Right. Curiosity. <laughs> yeah. Opens up with the black and white the director shot. director doesn't even know what the movie's about. <laughs> <laughs> He's just kind of filming stuff happen. It opens up with a black and white shot of a man with a strange mask gunning down girls with an old rifle as they run away. That is set in colonial times. Okay. And they have those little dresses like this might be in like the Salem area. It's it's the witch. Yeah. It's what I, it's what I wanted to do to the witch. Pretty no, <laughs> it, you know what? This does have a lot of uh, similarities to the witch, except for they don't talk like that. Okay. Because then it cuts to present day in color. Kate is in town for her lesbian sister's wedding. Kate is also the kind of a bitch to people. It doesn't seem to get along with anyone. And she's the main character. Okay. I hate that. Yeah. I hate when the main character is an asshole. When you can't sympathize with them, yeah. Yeah. They are at an island for the wedding, and it's kind of a dreary atmosphere. She stumbles around the island and sees a bunch of strange people and strange symbols, including the mask from the opening. Kate's sister's fiancé is a local girl whose family is very bizarre, dressing in all black and white and talking like they're from the colonial times, but not as much as... The witch, you know, you can understand what they're talking about. Right. They don't really have an accent or anything like that. It's just they talk very measured and slow and proper. Like Daniel Day-Lewis. So I wonder what's going to happen in this movie. Because you already know, just going into it, it's called Seven Witches. Yeah. It's set up in this way, you know, it's very predictable. Very predictable movie. Acting is either hit or miss. There, It's not... Ultra low or a high budget film. It's somewhere in the middle. Probably like a million dollars, I would guess. Maybe a little less than that. Maybe 500000 but it's not a $10,000 movie or a $5 million movie. So, A lot of reviewers praised the cinematography and compared it to The Witch. Hmm. But to me, it was either too dark at night or too bright during the day. And I was not so much of a fan of the artsy-fartsy camera work on the sex scene. Where images are kind of like bleeding into each other, like... It's like a horrible sex scene. Like 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 an Emmanuel I th- movie? I think it shows, yeah, like so, something like that. Yeah, it shows like one nipple, first of all. And this whole entire sex scene that's about... And it's his nipple. Three minutes long. <laughs> I think it was a body double, because of the way it cut to it. Right. But it's just like melting into each other uh, scenes. I, I hate that shit. And le- unless... Unless it's the shunting, people should not be melting into each other during sex. <laughs> unless they're actually melting into each <laughs> yeah. other like society. But the effects are minimal, but done okay with when they do them. Um, biggest problem is that there's only one likable character. Kate's weed-smoking hippie aunt. It's the only character I like in this movie. There's way too many scenes of fish being cut up and prepared for dinner. The lesbian euphemism. <laughs> Smells like fish, what the fuck right? <laughs> <laughs> I got a little bored, and just when I thought I was going to be under the IMDb score, the third act hit and stuff actually happened, and a whole lot of it happened at once. So this movie is only worth watching if you like the occult and witch movies okay. for its third act. IMBD, IMDb gives it a 4.0. I would give it a 5.1 bearded... Hasselhoff. Bearded Hasselhoff meat puppets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go with inappropriate sex act bears. I don't want to yeah. remember that. Yeah. You have a 5.1 inappropriate sex act bears. All right. The rating system we can never forget. How, how can we make that graphic of, with Biff, Biff's face attached to the bear? That has to happen now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got. I already got something. Oh, yeah. I'm working on. I'm okay. already working on a graphic, and it's pretty awesome. Inappropriate sex act, Biff. <laughs> That's how Bailey got pregnant. <laughs> it, it is. That's how that one time when Biff, I was petting him, scruffing down his ears. Yeah, and, and he got a boner. <laughs> and I looked, and he had a boner, and something leaked out of it onto my barefoot and my sandal. That was definitely inappropriate sex yes. act, Biff. 
<laughs> well, speaking of inappropriate sex acts. <sighs> so, b- before I talk about this movie, I, I feel like you and I have a slightly different philosophy on the bad movies, where, like, with you, like, you, you think, if I know this movie's gonna suck, like, I'm probably not gonna watch it. I'm never gonna watch it, yeah. You like, know? you watch some American yeah. Poltergeist, yeah. Ouija Experiment. Where, I try to watch things I think are gonna be yeah. good. I love the title of this movie. Yeah. That's why I wanted to yeah. watch it. Well, and, and I'll go into movies that, that I think might suck because every once in a while you you don't write that movie off and it's good. Yeah. And that's it's a true. gamble. That is very true. And and also I feel like, especially with movies like this one, as podcasters, as journalists. <laughs> audio journalists. As audio as members broad, of the press. As broadcast journalists, yeah. as Bobby Heenan would say, <laughs> we have a sort of obligation. To watch shitty movies so other people don't have to. Exactly. It's kind of like a, a service yeah. to people. Yeah, we're like superheroes. Yeah. <laughs> so so we watch movies that have good titles but might be shitty. Like like we watched The Taint. And The Taint could have been fucking awful. But it was good. It but was it funny. wasn't. You know? And this movie could have been fucking awful or it could have been fucking amazing. And in this case, it was fucking awful. But there's a difference between... A movie like American Poultry Guys uh-huh. and a movie like Don't Fuck in the Woods. Right, right. Well, but then, like we talked about in the last episode, American Poultry Guys 2 could have been god fucking awful, and it was a competent story that was just cheaply made. I don't agree, even though I've never <laughs> seen it. <laughs> so, so hey, hey, this, this is our service to you people that we, we watch bad movies so that we can tell you they suck, and then you don't have to watch them. And also, like, I, this, this deserves to be said because we've never really talked about this, but. When we do the good movie and the bad movie, even if these movies are bad, we still respect people creating them, making their art, and putting it out there. Except for the guy who made Shark Exorcist. Fuck that guy. (laughs) (laughs) You know, there's some of them maybe we don't respect, but, you know, we... They are contributing something. They're contributing more than us. We haven't made any movies, yeah. so... Yeah? I, well, I've made some movies. <laughs> i made some there. movies. I've made some homemade movies. <laughs> and they were horror. <laughs> they were, yes. Very horrifying at times. <laughs> so this movie is a 2016 slasher slash softcore porn movie called Don't Fuck in the Woods, directed by a fine gentleman by the name of Sean Burkett. Yes. And at first, I thought I was going to like this, even yeah. when I started watching it. Yeah. That opening scene. Yeah. Brandy Mason, the redhead in the glasses. Yeah. Delivering some good nudity right yeah. off the bat. <laughs> you saw Very her, attractive. You saw her butthole. <laughs> you did. You yeah. just see her butthole. I like that. Yeah. And, and, and then. You need more buttholes in movies. Yeah, there's not enough buttholes. In regular, in movie. regular yeah. movies. Not I was uh, watching it with Michelle, and I was like, is that her butthole? Michelle's like, that was her butthole. <laughs> yeah, I was a fan of that. Yeah. I'm a so, fan of her butthole. Yeah, yeah. Her, her butthole deserves its own movie. So, a group of friends go on a camping trip to celebrate graduating college, but once they enter the woods, the proverbial shit starts to hit the fan. That's the synopsis. It's another fucking, you know, fucking college-age kids go out to the woods, do stupid shit, get killed. You know why I turn this fucker off? Because at the beginning of the movie, this is my pet peeve, my mm-hmm. biggest pet peeve with movies. Do not hype them up to be something they're not. There's mm-hmm. a warning before the yeah. the movie promising it's going to be blood, boobs, and genitalia, and it's going to be brutal and all this stuff. Don't, you know, if you have a weak stomach or whatever. Yeah. And it's fucking horrible. Don't effects. do that shit unless you're going to fucking Yeah, they deliver on the nudity. Yeah, but... they do. You know, Lucifer Valentine puts those be- warnings at the beginning of his movie, and they mean something. <laughs> yes. You know, but th- this did not. This movie... Like, it, it started out, that, that cold open was okay, and then there was, like, this kind of funny scene where one of the characters is having a wet dream, and then it was just all downhill from there. The story was totally fucking inconsistent. The movie's called Don't Fuck in the Woods, and it starts with a monster killing people who fuck in the woods, but very quickly breaks away from its own premise when the monster just starts killing everyone, regardless of whether or not they're having sex, or specifically... If they are not getting laid. It's kind of like an old trope to where, like, the blood falls on the ground and it, you know, it revitalizes the creatures from the ground and they come up again and search for more blood, but instead it's semen. Yeah, and, and I'm going to get to, <laughs> I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, characters in this movie were fucking horrible, too. Everyone is shitty, bitchy, not fleshed out. The stoner character seemed like he might be funny and entertaining until he turned out to be a sexual predator. Characters would come and go without explanation. Nobody had any motivation except to get high, drunk, or laid. And there were points set up that never went anywhere, and every character was just fucking tedious and annoying. The direction was garbage. 
total amateur bullshit. The angle sucked. The lighting sucked. The sound was inconsistent. The director had no sense of timing, no sense of pace. The final confrontation scene with the it girl and the monster was literally three minutes of her hiding behind a tree whimpering while intense music played. Was she hotter than that redhead at the beginning? No. The nudity got worse as the movie progressed. Oh, they delivered in the beginning to yeah. draw you in, huh? Yeah. Because she was hot. Yeah. 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 Um, there was one other character who was attractive. Her name is Nadia White or Nadia Snow or something like that. But don't watch this movie. Just look her up on Google and watch the videos that come up and watch her actually get mouth fucked. Because <laughs> she's a mouth fuck porn star. Oh, okay. So don't waste your time with this movie. Just watch her mouth fuck videos. I was, con- I was convinced that that opening uh, scene, that girl would be a porn star just based on her body and stuff. Yeah. And that, but she, I guess she's not. Yeah. I, she's, Cause I Googled her yeah. and all I could find were clips from this movie. Yeah. Maybe. maybe I was going to Google myself, but. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the music was also very inconsistent. There was some decent metal stuff. But, like, every once in a while, they'd throw in this, like, shitty pop punk. And the music just seemed to be there as space filler. It wasn't there to set a scene. Like, they were they were setting up their campsite in a montage sent to death metal. Pop punk has no place in horror. The only place it has is for sixth grade girls to discover it and then start listening to Battle Religion and the Misfits and then get into punk. Yeah, start listening to actual punk. <laughs> um, the special effects in the movie were bad. The monster suit was so fucking cheesy that you could see the scenes in it in most scenes. Shitty lighting didn't help. It made the seams more obvious. The gore was either splatter on trees or quote-unquote guts that were obviously just nylon stockings soaked in fake blood. The only decent gore was uh, a castration scene. But by the time that happened, it was too little too late. Dude gets his dick ripped off. But by the time it was like, oh, there's finally a decent special effect. It'd be funny if it was just a dildo that got ripped off of him, but it was like not even the right color. Yeah, like a black dildo. Or it was just like a hot dog. (laughs) (laughs) Um... This movie is a fucking mess, and it's not the cheap special effects and the bad acting that really hinder it. It's the total inconsistency. It's set up as a comedy, but it's not funny. It misses the mark on being a pure slasher. It had a lot of opportunities to go insane and never did. I could have forgiven all the technical flaws if there was an ounce of actual creativity into it, but it's proof that tits and blood and a rubber monster don't make a good movie, like, by themselves. My big question is, why didn't the monster have a huge dick that it killed people with? The movie's <laughs> called Don't Fuck in the Woods. You've got a monster that's attracted to the scent of people fucking, wants to kill them. For some reason, he's taking ovaries, he's taking dicks, he, they never explain that. Why doesn't this monster just have a huge dick that he fucks people to death with? Or, the, or why doesn't this monster have a huge vagina that completely engulfs people and yeah, them? Yeah, something like that. You know, or there could be two monsters, and they're competing, and one has a dick and one has a vagina, (laughs) and if you fuck in the woods, you're going to draw the fuck monster. (laughs) And then the the male monster impels you with his dick into the female monster. Yeah. And they fuck you to death. Because the female monster has a huge vagina, but she's incapable of naturally lubricating, so they need the blood. (laughs) See, we just made a better movie than Don't Fuck in the Woods right here. (laughs) The monster specifically has no genitalia. There's a scene where the stoner dude tries to kick the monster in the nuts... And it's got a fucking Ken doll spot. Like, there's nothing, and the monster no sells it because That's why he's, he he's, he's, he's pissed off because he yeah. can't fuck. That that would have made a better movie, but they never even go into that. Um, this movie. Let's, let's not talk much more about this. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> this movie is not Shark Exorcist bad. Okay, yeah, because it did deliver some yeah. nudity. It's pretty damn close. As I said, I recommend that instead of watching the movie, you do a Google search on some of the actresses and watch their actual porn videos. It's a better use of your time. It's not even American Poltergeist bad, because at least it didn't try to present something as fact that anyone who has Google knows is not a fact. I thought it was a documentary. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I'm going to give it .5 out of 10 inappropriate sex act bears. Inappropriate sex act (laughs) bears. Fuck this movie. Well, my good movie. 2016, written and directed by Justin M. Seaman. <laughs> Seaman? <laughs> Maybe it's Simon. It's S E I M A N. Maybe it's Simon. I prefer to say Seaman. Seaman, yeah. <laughs> Starring Mitchell Mussolino, Will Stout, with appearances by the legendary Linnea Quigley and the first Jason Voorhees, Ari Lemon. Seaman. Justin Seaman. <laughs> the Barn. 
Have you heard of this? I saw the. I haven't seen the you movie. See the trailer? But I saw the 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 picture. Picture for it. Yeah. Did you see the trailer? Uh uh-uh. uh Trailer's awesome. Trailer's better than the movie. Probably. Okay. Um, it's Halloween, nineteen eighty nine. Best friends Sam and Josh are trying to enjoy what's left of their final Devil's Night before graduating high school. But trouble arises when the two pals and a group of friends take a detour on their way to a rock concert, finding an old abandoned barn and awakening the evil inside. Is now it like an evil horse? No, it's <laughs> not. Now it's up to Sam and Josh to find a way to protect their friends and defeat the creatures that lurk within the barn. When I saw the 80s out trailer for this, I was super excited. You guys, check it out on IMDb, The Barn. The trailer will totally get you in. Total 80s camera work, cheesy acting, 80s music. It was pretty awesome. A child being pickaxed in the skull opening this movie. Okay. <laughs> straight into some That's credits. That's a cold open. <laughs> straight into some credits and music that is straight out of 1989. Sam and Josh run a sweet amateur haunted house and when stuck up religious nut, Miss Barnhart, played by horror legend Linnea Quigley, nice. complains to their parents they are forced to split apart but they need one last hurrah seeing the rock band Demon Inferno on Halloween night. Got three awesome monsters. The Boogeyman, who looks kind of like a miner. The pumpkin-headed Hallow Jack, who's like got a pumpkin head with fire for eyes and, and mouth. Like, is it CG or is it... I think it's like a, a little screen with li- like a little video playing of okay. fire. I don't think it's CG. Because it looks 80s style. This is very true to the 80s. Oh, nice. All of it. Nice. And the candy corn scarecrow, who has a mouth of candy corn on his belly that can bite people. Each, each has their own backstory and preferred method of killing. Ari Lemon is Dr. Rock, the host of the, the Rock Block, which is like a combination of Headbangers Ball and 80s horror hosts like Elvira. Okay. So it's like an 80s metal horror show that he hosts. That should be a thing. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I'm Wolfman Jack. <laughs> Some of the effects are questionable at times, but there's a lot of cutaways, but it still works. Are they questionable practical effects, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that could just be going with the theme, too. Yeah, Or, or too. at least working... And cutaways. There working are with, some good effects, yeah. though, too. Working so, with their limitations, sort of. For sure. And just making it like 80s, where you know you see the blood hit the wall, but you don't see what happens. Right. Of. That happens sometimes, but it does show other stuff. But effects are not what are the best part of this movie. Um, saves... True to the 80s, they aren't really inventing the wheel here. There's comedy, boobs, concerts, blood, and Halloween. That's all you need. That's, that's, that's <laughs> kind of what you need, as long as it's well done. I like how when the shit hits the fan and people are dying during a costume party, people run away in costumes, but there's people that like make sure not to drop their props, like their fake knife, and they're running away from actual <laughs> monsters. Or a pitchfork if he's a devil guy. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta paid, hold on to this plastic pitchfork. I paid eight ninety nine for this at Party City. <laughs> They even added some of that shitty computer electricity, like at the end of Hellraiser. Nice. You know, where you, you hit the guy and he's got this little spark of yeah. stupid electricity. Apparently, there's also an 8-bit video game of the barn that I need to play. That That's awesome. Made. I guess they made this video game and this trailer to fund this movie. Uh-huh. They did the GoFundMe or Indiegogo and all that kind of stuff with this, and it worked. I liked it. I liked it a lot. It looks like you're watching an 80s movie. If you did not know this was in 2017 and no one told you and you watched it, you would think it was 1989. So it the actually... camera is it, 1989. It looks authentically 80s as opposed to like... Uh, it looks like, like a VHS tape okay. when you watch it. But even like the actors, like they had that 80s look. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's all 80s out. Nice. It's really... It's it's like that, you know? Um, I, I really wish that... I, they do have a scene where they're drinking like Cokes and the Coke is like... The, the way the cup looks is... Like it does, it's not the current Coke logo of like you, a cup you'd get, you know. Yeah, that was pretty cool. But other than that, there's not a lot of product placement. I really feel like when you do these '80s throwbacks, it'd be cool if there was a lot more product placement of things that were only '80s, yeah. you know, or early '90s. If Crystal you're doing Pepsi that. and shit like that, that kind that, of yeah. stupid shit. You know what I mean? It might be a little bit. It might price you out. Yeah, but you could at least like print some bootleg uh, labels yeah. on a real Pepsi or whatever. You yeah. know, if you were going to do that. Or, you know, Pepsi instead of Pepsi, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. IMD gives us a 6.0. I'm going to give it 7.1, Inappropriate Sex Act Bears. And I do recommend you guys watch this. I would have given it a stronger rating if it turned up the gore a little bit more, but I understand that there were some budgetary restrictions. I really like the three bad guys. Yeah. The three monsters are cool. 
Awesome. And the backstory. Yeah. Don't knock on that barn. I'm going to do it because I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm a dumbass and I don't think it's real. I'm going to knock on it on Halloween night. <laughs> right. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> cool. I'll check it out. Yeah, you, you need to. It's pretty cool. So. My, uh, my good movie succeeded where my bad movie failed. Also a horror comedy. 2014, directed by Brendan Jackson Rogers and written by our new friend Stephen Byro. Yeah. Based on the comic book of the same name, Bubba the Redneck Werewolf, streaming now on Amazon.com. Amazon Prime. So, Cracker County, the town of Broken Taint, is under attack. <laughs> Broken Taint? Broken Taint, Cracker County, Florida. That's it's, now for the rest of my wrestling career. I'm going to be billed from Broker t- Broken Taint. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> Broken Taint, Florida. From Broken Taint, Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> it's under attack. And a lovesick dog catcher named Bubba Blanche has been transformed into a ferocious, cigar-smoking werewolf in order to save the day. Save the day. But first he's got to conquer a beer or two. Maybe a plate of chicken wings. (laughs) This movie felt like a classic trauma movie. It was simple stuff. You know, a loser sells his soul to the devil to get his girlfriend back, makes things worse for everyone around him, and has to fight to make it right. But the whole thing was punctuated by some really funny side gags, like this whole scene of Satan wreaking havoc around the town and generally being a dick to rednecks. Like, he puts gun club on the side of a building and all these rednecks file in and then the gun club sign disappears and it says book club and all the rednecks run screaming out. <laughs> and like, he steals candy from a baby and then gives the baby a flask of liquor and the mom turns around and sees the baby drinking the flask in the stroller and like takes it away and then drinks it. <laughs> uh, uh, just, you know, stupid... <laughs> Putting bananas in the tailpipes of fucking beaten down old redneck trucks and shit. You know, it's it's pretty cool because that shows Stephen Byer has a big range. Yeah. When we talked to him too, he was saying he likes the straight horror and not yeah. the comedy and stuff. Yeah. But the fact that he could write it anyways, yeah. you know, it's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, just, you know, and, and there was also this extended Abbott and Costello routine that ran through the entire movie. Because he was, uh, Bubba the Redneck Werewolf was trying to find this guy named Stephen Who, who could tell him what he needed to do to defeat Satan. And it was always like, Stephen who? What? No, what's his cousin? What? No, what's his cousin? Who, who's cousin? Yeah, who's cousin? <laughs> it just ran through the whole movie. But then, like, as opposed to the Abbott and Costello act just ending, this one ended in splatter and violence. That's awesome. Yeah. So the How whole... the court? Um, there was some CG splatter that wow. I didn't like. And there was some CG gunfire. Obviously budgetary restriction. Yeah. But when they did do actual gore, when they did do actual prosthetics, it looked good. Satan's music, or music, Satan's makeup looked great. Bubba's makeup looked great. Uh, Satan's going around town granting people wishes. And, like, one guy wishes for a third hand so he can tickle his balls while he jacks off. And, but the hand grows out of his forehead and isn't long enough to reach his dick. And then there's <laughs> another guy who wished to be the Batman. So he's got, like, a baseball bat shoved through his head now, but he's still alive. Um... <laughs> Yeah, just all that stuff was very well done. the The CG splatter was like, ah, oh, fuck, that kind of takes me out. I need to check, it, check this fucker out. Yeah, it sounds like I'd really like. Yeah, it. Uh, Bubba was an endearing fuck up. His girlfriend kind of came off as shallow and unlikable, but she was the only character that was like that. There are these two rednecks who hung out in the bar named Drunk Cletus and Cousin Clovis, and they were hilarious. All the peripheral characters were ridiculous, but the standout performance was by Mitch Hyman, who created the comic book series, who played the devil. He was smooth, he was smug, and he was totally joyous in his dickish, dick, dickishness. This was a Satan who was surrounded by morons and didn't have to hide what he was, so he relished in his freedom to just wreak havoc. Um, like, he walks into the bar, and he's bright red, and he's got horns. And nobody re- notices what's going on. I'm like, oh, there's a new guy in the bar. <laughs> um, the direction was standard and competent. The music was what really stood out, though. It reminded me of Dead and Breakfast, in a sense, where the music was used to push the story along and narrate some of the action as it was happening. And it was this, you know, banjo-picking, redneck country music. That's awesome. But, like, singing the song of Bubba the Redneck Werewolf. About things that are happening. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that about Dead and Breakfast. Dead and Breakfast is so underrated. Yeah. uh, Underrated, and, uh, yeah... I, I really want to check this out, yeah. especially for that. And the the band that they got to do all of these country songs is apparently a band from somewhere in the south that makes horror country. Oh wow! So, horror yeah, country, yeah, yeah. That's they its own thing. Got a, a couple songs already, you know, in the film. Uh, and I, I looked up some of their other stuff online. Yeah, they make they write country songs about monsters. 
So it's pretty unique. I don't remember what they're called. I should have written that down. But yeah, the, the opening credit song, as soon as it started up, it just totally it popped me. It, yeah. Yeah, it, it had me. Um, this was a silly, fun, stupid movie that's great for a night when you just want to disconnect and watch something ridiculous. It has some flaws, mostly due to budget constraints, but it more than made up for any technical low points with good jokes and a lot of creativity. Um, Stephen Biro, Biro wrote a solid script for it. The director knew what he was doing, and I think having the actual comic book creator involved in the entire process um, really brought out some of the best in the movie. So I'm going to give it 8.5 out of 10 inappropriate sex act bears. Inappropriate sex act bears. All right. That bear's wow. giving a blowjob. <laughs> Bear rim jobs. <laughs> we will be back. Bear Top back. five horror video games. But uh, you guys check that out. Amazon Prime, Bubba the Redneck World. Yep. Costs you zero dollars. Watch it for free it. for zero dimes. Uh-huh. And we'll be back. After this, Saturday, June 17th at 8 o'clock p.m. at the Galaxy Theater in Atascadero, California, Postmortem is joining forces with our friend Danny Foster to bring to you a screening of the one and only Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. But it's not just the screening. No, no it isn't, because we are going to have Leslie Vernon himself, Nathan Basil, in attendance as well as director David Stevie, because they're going to be doing a live Q&A with us, a live podcast for Postmortem, and they're going to be raising funds for their new movie, the next installment in the Behind the Mask franchise. But wait, there's more. We're going to have some raffles, we're going to have some information, some shit given away. There's going to be the Q&A, we're doing our live podcast, there's going to be a live horror art exhibit. Robbie and Shayla from Cherry Boston Blossom Tattoos will be raffling off five hundred dollar horror tattoos. Five hundred dollar themed horror tattoos. I'm gonna have to enter that raffle. I'm gonna enter that raffle too. I'm gonna buy it. We're gonna have great giveaways from our sponsors: NECA, Trick or Treat Studios, Fright Rags, Dark Delicacies, London 1888, Captain Nemo Comics, Rocket Fizz, Sankal Professional Wrestling, and The Haunt in the Tascadero. And Satan himself. And Satan himself will also be sponsoring us. And Ben. Each ticket will come with a signed print from the upcoming horror project. How much do these tickets cost? These tickets are only ten dollars American. Ten Amer ten American motherfucking dollars. Ten dollars you get to see behind the mask in the big screen. You get a chance to enter all these raffles. You get a live Q and A with the star and the director. You get to smell us. <laughs> you get to smell us and see us. You only get to hear us normally, but you get to smell, see, and possibly taste. That's one of the raffles. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's only 230 seats to fill. We're going to fill them all. People are going to be coming from all around the globe to this event. Get your ass to a task. You need to be one of them. Yeah. Catch a bus, a train. Fucking jump on the back of a giant condor. <laughs> <laughs> Ride a fucking ostrich. Yeah. Get here how you need to get here. Learn to teleport, motherfucker. Then teach me. <laughs> I'll let you in for free. <laughs> you, yeah, if, if you teach us how to teleport, you can come in for free. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure that uh, they will be okay. I mean, with technically, that. if you can teleport, can't you get anywhere for free? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, the strategy is not really working out because now we're going to have 230 people who just teleported there and we're not making any money. For They're the all going to be Nightcrawler from X Men. <laughs> No, they won't. <laughs> and we will see you guys June 17th. Yeah, be there. Be there. Be there, be there, be there. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show the one and only Nathan Basil, a.k.a. Leslie Vernon from Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. Hi, y'all. Hey, thanks for coming on. Uh, we're real excited for our, our upcoming event. Saturday, June 17th at the Galaxy Theater in Atascadero, the Behind the Mask screening, live Q&A, and you're going to be there with the writer, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I read uh, something uh, somebody posted, I think uh, maybe Danny posted, that uh, that Ben Pace is also coming up with us. So um, if so, then it, it'll be a hoot. Um, ben is uh, <laughs> Ben's a real fun guy. Awesome. Yeah, we're doing the live Q&A. There's going to be an art prop exhibit. They're giving away raffles with prizes and tattoos. It's going to be a good time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty much everything. Uh, everything is being squeezed into one event. Everything. 
It's going to be madness. So uh, we're we're trying to raise some funds here for you guys, and I know I know that there's some online fundraising going on too. What exactly are we raising funds for here? Well, I, you may or may not know that um, we've had a sequel script that has been written. Oh gosh, it's going on about five, maybe even six years now. Um, David Stevie, the the original screenwriter, he wrote a sequel script. It's fantastic. Uh, by Every account, mine included, uh, it reads even better than the first. And the first read clean, like no scripts you've you've ever read. I mean, it was just a, a real piece of work. And uh, the sequel script strong needs to be updated. Obviously, um, six years, but um, yeah, with some stumbles trying to get the sequel out the gate, Scott. Glosserman, the director, exec producer, uh, co-screenwriter, he he also um, felt like this is this is ridiculous. Um, there's uh, there's resources that we have here. There's leverage that we have here, and um, and he he decided, all right, let's do a comic, let's do a comic book uh, series of the script of the sequel script, and um, it will be a fantastic way to one uh, get the the fundraising ball going and to to further the the franchise in a way that that is perfect for our film i mean the uh, the the comic book um you know comic is 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 a perfect form for what it is that we're doing it's just uh it's right up the same alley as as where we like to play so uh, we're doing a fundraising right now for a six-issue series. We've already raised the funds for the first, so the first is going to be going out the door in a um, couple months, and uh, and then yeah, we'll keep the rest coming as the as the funds keep going. So would the plan be to keep this in comic format, or would it be eventually something that transitions into a film sequel? Yeah, um, there's there's not really giving too much away, specifically because what the where the film lives is in the uh, you know the filmic conventions. So um, we can suit what it is that we're doing, the story that we're telling um, in comic book form. That works cool, but the real um, the real tricks and the real fun are going to be had in uh, in the cinematic experience absolutely and, and uh, ultimately that's where we're looking to get it oh, something that that yeah you know, i had read about the the comic book situation uh a couple months ago maybe uh right right when the online announcement started happening and right. yeah you know, my first thought was a comic book would be great i'm a huge comic book fan and i and i love the movie but yeah, you know, and I and I'm not just saying this because you're on the show, and I'm trying to you know <laughs> polish you up or anything like that. But one of the things that really sold the movie was was what you brought to Leslie Vernon, and mm. the sort of charisma that you brought to him, and also the sort of psychotic gleefulness that you brought to him. And I'm curious to see how they're going to translate that to a comic book character. Yeah, I'm curious to see that too. <laughs> it's it, 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 it was really fantastic. The the first time around, the first film. Um, it was the first film I'd done, and so I didn't really have any kind of frame of reference. I wanted to get plugged in in every way that I could, and fortunately, um, Scott let me. And uh, so I, I, I got to be a, a fly on the wall for, and, and actually have some creative input too, um, for all of the aspects from production to post. And it was a really fascinating experience with this it feels like something that I, I, I a pie that i could probably stick my fingers into i love comics my my kids love comics um you know it's a it's a it's a format that i adore um so i i, I suppose i i should probably get my fingers in the pie if i if i feel like it but it, i no it, it it i feel like this is this is going to be its own thing it's it's gonna um uh it's in the hands of some really fast, fantastically creative people. And, uh, and I, I've always trusted Scott, um, his vision and his execution. So I'm just kind of standing back on this one. And when, when you see it the first time is when I'm going to see it the first time. Um, as far as the film stuff goes, yeah, I, I have no idea how, how, how Leslie's personality translates, uh, visually into panel form, but, 
um, that'll be cool to <laughs> to yeah. see how how that happens, you know. Well, and and the writing was so strong in the first movie to create such an iconic character in one dough to where you know this movie's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts, and uh, the, with his experience of doing it and the fact of how endeared the uh, the character is, the next incarnation of Leslie Vernon, I bet is going to be even better. You know, like you said, the the screenplay is even better and. I know it's going to be awesome. So, well, well, you know what? We're uh, you know, I don't think it gives anything away, but um, you know, we're, we're we're playing the first time around. We were playing with horror convention, and and the, and that was you know fun. But the the second time around, we're doing a sequel, and we're very aware that we're doing a sequel. And so, the convention that we get to toy around with the second time through is those conventions of sequels and prequels and and uh, postquels, and you know uh, just all of those uh, little uh, moments we get to we get to satirize we get to memorialize we get to um, we get to love on um, we always had a tremendous amount of respect going in uh, for the for behind the mask uh, the first time around we we all had a tremendous amount of respect for for the genre and how we um, felt responsibility for representing the genre for for horror fans and for non-horror fans too but but we particularly wanted to make sure that the horror community felt like they were watching a love note happen you know in in front of their eyes um second time through yeah it's 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 a love note it's a love note that's now playing in in sequel forms and in conventions and um yeah so that's going to be a whole other fun kind of ball of wax to pick apart that's one of the big things i was wondering is because you guys had had captured lightning in the bottle the first time with the first movie you know and part of me wondered with the second movie are they going to try and do the same thing again or are they going to try and create new lightning and it sounds like you're going in the in the new lightning direction yeah I, I, everybody feels like there's some technical things that have to be addressed in order to justify bringing the band back together i mean you you the, the because the first one played in a uh, there's some uh, for, for anybody that hasn't seen it uh, the, there there's some technical aspects to it that we that we toy around with that um are really important to what what behind the mask is and um how do you justify those kinds of technicalities uh, can you justify those kinds of technicalities uh, on their own uh, for their own merits rather than just trying to plug it into a uh, kind of formula that was created the first time around and you're executing for for no that you're executing that format for for no other reason than uh, it worked the first time around so stick with what you know um, I, nobody. <laughs> Nobody has an interest in sticking with what we know. We 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 do, however, feel like um, it's important to uh, um, to turn ourselves on in similar ways that we felt turned on the first time around. And so, cinematically speaking, um, Scott wants to make sure that the visual story that's being told is interesting insightful and impactful and um the david found a really fantastic way a uh, vehicle to to, uh, to take care of those technical those cinematic aspects um without just feeling like we're treading over the same ground and you're involved with uh, the new project wait for it as well aren't you I am involved. Uh, yeah, I um, I found out that David Stevie was uh, was doing a short. He has he's he's always writing. He's he's a very industrious guy. But this was the first project that he decided I'm not gonna I'm not gonna wait for anybody to tell me uh, that you know the the light has the green light has been lit. Um, I'm gonna make it happen on my own and um, and. Uh, I am really impressed that a guy who has absolutely no experience outside of the, you know, screenwriter 
uh, uh, realm and the experience that he's had being on set and, 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 and checking out the post process behind the mask. Um, this guy has taken, taken everything on his shoulders. And so he's exec producing and he's directing and he's casting. And, um, uh, I, I was thrilled to hear that he was, he was just strapping it on and going for it. And so I said, Hey, you know, any, any way that I can help, um, and, uh, and so he, he gave me a call and pulled me in. So I, I, I am a participant as well. Cool. I, we, we have a lot of respect for that, that DIY ethos. J- Jason comes from the, the punk scene and I come from the industrial scene and that's very much what we're all about. So it's cool to see someone just kind of, you know, strap on those boots and, and stomp for it. You know what? If, if you're waiting around for somebody to tell you it's okay to go do it, <laughs> you really shouldn't bother going and do it in the first place. Especially yeah. an independent horror. And is yeah. this, this is going to be a horror project, right? Wait for it. Is it is horror? Yeah, it is horror. It's, um, it's exactly what the title says. It's, um, it's, it's that, that moment, that perpetual moment before something's about to happen. And uh, you, you feel it's coming and you know it's coming and it's just around the corner. Um, he's found a way in script form to represent that, that, that quality, that, um, that electric kind of goosing the audience kind of quality um, for an eight minute short. Uh, it's eight minutes of that electric <laughs> just you know it's coming oh boy here we go and uh yeah it's really cool awesome yeah and uh tickets for the event are only going to be ten dollars for the base price there are some upgrades you can purchase if you want to get a piece of history of yourself pictures things like that if you want to come to the event and once again it's june 17th at the galaxy theaters in atascadero california there's a Facebook event, uh, there's a, a page for it, and on postmortemshow.com we are advertising it with a commercial and everything like that too. So if you guys want to check this out, we'd love to have you as a guest to this event. And we don't want to take up too much of your time because we are going to be doing the Q&A and live podcast portion at the actual event. So I want to thank you for coming on and telling us about what you got going on, and we look forward to seeing you. Awesome. I appreciate you guys taking an interest and in, uh, in helping out too. It's it's a cause that obviously is near and dear to our hearts, but but uh, we're representing a cause that's near and dear to a lot of the horror community's hearts. So um, helping us is helping you. All right. Thanks a lot, man. We appreciate it, and we will see you on June seventeenth. Looking forward to it, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Prepare to embark on a fleeting journey to the outer reaches of consciousness. Mechanical Ghost presents as Mary D. Volume 1. Stepping sideways and descending. An experiment in audio necromancy designed to stimulate your pineal gland and open your mind to a world beyond life and death. Go to www.mechanicalghost.com to purchase your copy. The Plague Doctor awaits. Top five horror video games of all the times. Of all the times, but most of mine are old. Yeah, <laughs> that's just how I roll. <laughs> uh, yeah, most of mine are pretty old too. Um, all of my new ones ended up in my honorable mention. Once again, this list was inspired by listener Eileen, who gifted us the horror game Soma on Steam. Come on, Eileen. Come on, Eileen. Give us more games. <laughs> I don't know the rest of the list. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it, and uh, yeah, so if you guys have a suggestion for a top five list, email us over at postmortemshow at gmail.com. We will read your list on the air. Eileen, also incidentally, one of the biggest supporters of Mechanical Ghost that is not someone that I'm dating. Wow, that's yeah, awesome. She's, she's bought my album. She's bought my albums for her friends as well. That's awesome. And then her friends have been like, 
her, one of her friends wrote a little review of it and sent it to her saying that he liked it. But he said that he, he had had some head trauma and he had to uh, wait till he got better from the head trauma because he tried to listen to it while he was still having problems. <laughs> and it like, it like tripped him out too much. Head trauma. Yeah, so, so I got to put a warning on my next ambient album. Do not listen <laughs> a while under the effects of head trauma. <laughs> All right, what's your number five? My number five is a game from the early 2000s called Ghostmaster. Ghostmaster? Yeah, it's a PC game. Is it one of those virtual reality games where you beat off? <laughs> like Ghostmaster Bader? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Um, it was actually an incomplete game. They, 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 the company went out of business before they could totally finish it, so the developers released it on their own. Uh, with a plan to release more content later, but couldn't get the budget for it. Which makes me sad, because the game itself is fucking excellent. In the game, you're, like, the the headmaster of, like, a ghost college, and you have to put together teams of ghosts and then send them to houses to haunt people. And there's, like, psychic ghosts that figure out what the people there are scared out of and are scared of, and then there's ghosts that have different abilities. And the whole point is to either scare someone, the humans there, so bad that they run off the map, or go completely insane and devolve into gibbering messes. Is it like The Sims, the way that the yeah. camera is? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's what I was imagining. It, it's different settings, and they're all like loosely based on different horror movies. There's like you know the Evil Dead Cabin in the Woods thing, and there's the there's the Poltergeist house, but like you know, there's some humor in it too. Um, and in every house, there's a ghost there that you can do certain things to unlock them, and then they come into your team. Oh, so you can use it in the future? Yeah. That sounds really cool. And so, like, you know, say there's someone in in your house who's, like, scared of water. You can bring in your ghost that creates illusions and have them, you know, make the house seemingly fill up with water. Or there's, like, air sprites that make it rain. But it's not enough to just, like, bombard someone with the thing they're scared of. You have to sort of guide them like lemmings. Once they start getting scared, they'll just start running around the house freaking out. So you have to anticipate their moves and where they're going to go to hide and sort of watch their patterns scare them again. and scare them until they're outside of the house. And then you have to scare them off the map or just drive them completely insane. Oh, that's cool. And it's a lot of fun. Um, I don't know if it's on Steam or, or where anyone can find it. Uh, Ghostmaster. Yeah, Ghostmaster is an excellent fucking you gotta game. got to check that fucker out. My number five. So way back in the day, one of the first first-person shooters ever was Wolfenstein 3D. Yep. Love it to death, but not a horror game. No. However, in 2009, Wolfenstein was remade. They made a new Wolfenstein that was just called Wolfenstein. Okay. And it was really like, uh, you could stop time, and, and there was like these skeleton things that you'd fight, and it's definitely a horror game. Was it the same kind of like original Wolfenstein graphics, or did they... No, it was awesome. Okay. It was great. And then uh, Wolfenstein the Old Blood. Wolfenstein the New Order Mm -hmm. and Wolfenstein the Old Blood just recently came out for Xbox One, PlayStation 4. And uh, those are both amazing. I would say that New Order isn't so much of a horror game, although it does have horror elements. But the Old Blood is straight horror for like half the game. Nice. And it's fucking awesome. Wolfenstein the Old Blood. You guys got to check that out. You can get it on Steam for pretty cheap. Um, You can get Wolfenstein... 2009 also for really cheap. You're going to probably have to go to like GameStop or something and get a used disc though because I don't think it's on Steam. Okay. Um, but if you want to play it on Xbox or PC, that 2009 Wolfenstein is fucking amazing. Nice. I didn't even know that came out. Yeah, it's really good. And then uh, the Old Blood is even better. Nice. Uh, my number four is one of the OG horror games from back in the day, like back in the fucking 90s. Uh, one of the early CD-ROM games where they had the live-action motion and everything, a uh, puzzle game called The Seventh Guest. I've heard of this. I've never played yeah. it. Going Great through game. my research, yeah. it came up a lot, and I never played it. It's a classic game, and then there was a sequel called The Eleventh Hour that was also pretty good. Um, they also have recently ported The Seventh Guest to uh, iPad and a few other uh, tablet devices. But the premise of the game is you you don't know who you are. You've got amnesia, and you just show up in this mansion uh, that was owned by a dead toy maker uh, who had invited six different people from various parts of society to his house, and they all disappeared. And so you have to go around the house and find the different puzzles that this toy maker set up for you. You solve the puzzles, and then you get a little cinematic of how each person died. And you have to figure out who the seventh guest is. If you're the seventh guest, are you alive or are you a ghost? Yeah. And uh, it, because it was one of the first early games to have 
you know, actual actors projected into the scene. It's it, like the, that's probably where Shyamalan and Ding Dong got the Sixth Sense idea. Probably, yeah. <laughs> um, it was, it added a lot to the horror aspect of the game because it really felt like you were watching a movie and it was very, very creepily done. I mean, you go back and watch it now and the graphics are kind of cheap. You know, they're very cheap. They're very pixelated because it was the early version of that. But I, I remember seeing it back in the day and it fucking changed my life. I'll have yeah. to check that one out too. I'm pretty sure you you will have heard of all of my games and I will have heard of none of yours. In addition, all of my games are first person and probably only a couple of yours are because you already got two. That's third person too, right? Uh, no, it, it is first person, but you don't run around like in Doom. It's like click to the next thing. It's like mist. Oh, okay. Because yeah. the, the graphic, the, those kind of graphics didn't exist when, when I mean, Wolfenstein didn't even come out when Seventh Guest was made. Wow. Um, okay. it, it was very much a mist style game where you just move to the next scene and then the scenes move around and there's things you can like investigate and discover. Um, and of course there's the puzzles, but yeah, the, the, you don't do a lot of running around. It's not, it's not action. Okay. Sounds pretty cool. I'll have to check that fucker out. My number four. Pretty, uh, you know, there's a lot of zombie games. There's a lot of undead. But this one came out and basically was Event Horizon, the game. But they didn't say it. Dead Space. Yep. Have you played it? I've played Dead Space and Dead Space 2, yeah. Yeah, it's fucking awesome. And the fact that the creatures, there's a bunch of different creatures. And to kill them, you have to decapitate their, or you have to amputate their limbs. The necromorphs, that's yeah, what the they're necromorphs, called. Yeah, the necromorphs, yeah. Instead of their head, it's their limbs. Yeah. Which is a way out concept. Yeah. Not, no horror movie has even had that. Yeah. So, but this game did. And there's a bunch of different fucking creatures. There's zero gravity. There's places you go where you don't have air. And you so have you to gotta yeah. get air tanks. You can float around in space. It's really, really fun to play. The one thing I hated about that game was the part where you had to shoot the asteroids. When oh, the shoot me was getting too. Bombarded. And you die so many yeah, times. I, I think, probably died 30 times yeah, in that part. Definitely. Yeah, that was fucking. Horrible. It almost made me quit playing, but when you get past it, it's totally worth it. Yeah, and the bosses are cool, yeah. and like the orbs, like the yellow orbs you gotta shoot and stuff. And, yeah. And it's terrifying. It's, it's a very like scary game. Flesh monsters coming out of the walls and shit. Yeah, it will yeah. make you fucking jump. Yeah. I didn't like Dead Space 2 as much, because I felt like it was more just run and shoot, run and shoot. Where was, Dead... I like the snow aspect of it. That, that was cool, cool. yeah. It, it did have some good elements, and I heard that, like, that was sort of the... That game was the slump, and then they got better again afterwards. And I don't... Yeah, there's no there's more. A, the, there's a third one. The third one, yeah, yeah but that's yeah, that's it. Third, third one's a cool. It's like the the first one is the best. Yeah, though, because the, after that you know what you're getting into. Right. The first one you're like, oh my god, this yeah. is awesome. Yeah, and the and crafting your weapons and stuff yeah. and making them upgrade and customizing stuff like that. your suit and all that. Yeah, but in the later chapters of it, you can combine weapons and shit, and that's pretty cool. That's cool. So. I remember the first time just seeing the first necromorph bust out. Yeah. And, like, just being like, oh, And they holy run up on fuck. you all yeah. fucking crazy, swinging their limbs, you know? Yeah. Good they're shit. They're like a combination of, like, the bugs from Starship Troopers and a zombie. Yeah. Like, the way their limbs are. And, like, and the thing. Spikes. Yeah, the thing. Yeah, there's a lot of thing going on there. But, yeah, it was a very refreshing take on the, on the zombie genre. So, number three. My number three is Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. I'm a huge fan of the Vampire the Masquerade role-playing game series, and uh, Bloodlines was the first full-length, actual competent video game made after the Vampire the Masquerade series. There were some shitty ones made before that that aren't even worth looking into, but Bloodlines was an open-world kind of game. Uh, it didn't quite have the same scope as something like Fallout 2 or something like or Fallout 3, where the, the world is vast because that technology didn't exist. But you play as a newly embraced vampire, and you choose from the different clans of vampires, and and you know your power base and all that, and the way that you interact with all of the vampires and other supernatural creatures that you meet up with affects how the game progresses. And so it has so it's like a choose your own adventure book. Yeah, it has a huge replay value because it's. I mean, it's like Fable too. That game Fable. Yeah, you heard of that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it touches on. You know, you play as a vampire, but it touches on almost every horror genre. You're dealing with werewolves. you got to go into a haunted house at one point and, like, exercise the ghost. You've got, you know, weird monsters that live in the sewer that are feeding on vampires. And this is before Blade 2, where, you know, where they were doing that in the movie. Uh, and the, the whole thing is just a great open-world game that still holds up today. Uh, you can get it on Steam. Um and they've made some improvements to it because there was a lot of glitchiness in the original release. 
graphics and stuff. Yeah, they made the graphics better and all that, and it's just it's just a very very good game, even if you don't play the the <coughs> the White Wolf original games. Cool. My number three is a sci-fi horror game. The second game is a better game, I would say. A more fun game to play and a lot longer of a game. But the first one is much more horror-oriented. Half-Life. Really? The original Half-Life has a lot of fucking horror elements. With the the head crab zombie people and dark places where shit jumps out at you and scares the fucking bejesus out of you. Mm -hmm. And I love Half-Life. Well, I've never played any of them. You never played Half Life? No. What the fuck are you doing? You yeah. need to play some Half Life more than any <laughs> Xbox One game or anything. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. You got to play that shit. Yeah, it's awesome. Huh. And it's like interdimensional portals and stuff in the first one. The first one is way more horror sci-fi oriented. The second one does have a lot of more like technology kind of based stuff too, in addition to the creature. Mm -hmm. uh, but first one is all creature alien portal to another dimension opens up and these creatures come through it and then you have to go there too oh wow and it's really fun to play it's a first person shooter and great fucking guns and stuff the multiplayer is fun it's a great game uh, I didn't I, I figured it was I thought, I thought it was just like a space game no I didn't know that it was horror oriented that's cool oh yeah it's horror sci-fi yeah. yeah I mean I know the Half-Life engine is like one of, one of the base engines that they use for a lot of a lot of games number but... two heavily rips off the Starship Troopers they have these things called Antilands that come out of the ground and they are the bug from Starship Troopers oh shit and you have different you know you have like crossbows with dynamite on it and just different kinds of guns and shit and it's really fun there's cool bosses there's uh, there is a, a lot there is a real real horror area in number two that's heavily horror influenced mm -hmm. um, but number one has more of the like it's a dark room and shit jumps out at you and shit nice so, but definitely you need to, that's the next game you need to play cool like. I'll give it a look it's cheap too on Steam you can get it for dirt cheap it, they, it's a whole collection for 20 bucks so I think shit. they have it for Xbox and stuff too yeah oh well, yeah they have it for X, I, Xbox One Xbox 360 right. um, it's uh, backwards compatible too cool orange, orange box Half-Life 2 but I think you should play Half-Life 1 before you play Half-Life 2 so you can meet the characters and stuff. Cool, yeah, I'll give it a look. I can let you borrow number two for... Uh, it's backwards compatible on Xbox One. Is that one of those games where when you beat it like a certain way through, and then you play the second game, your character carries over into the next game? Yeah. Okay, I like that element of games. Yeah, yeah pretty much, yeah. It's like continuous, so... Yeah. And Half-Life 3 needs to come out. They've been teasing it for a long time, but it's not out, so... My number two is... Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth. It's a, uh, I think it was only released for Xbox when it came out. And the first Xbox? Yeah. Yeah, it's and, old, right? And now you can, I think you can get it on Steam. I think they ported it to, uh, to PC now. Um, but uh, it is a, it is a, I think the first first person shooter to actually make my list. Um, but it's... Oh, it's first person? It's first person, but it doesn't start out as a shooter. It starts out as... you. It's it's basically set during Shadow Over Innsmouth during that story. Yeah, um, you're like a Dagon. Yeah, yeah. You're you're a detective, and you start out investigating this cult, and uh, you see some shit that makes you crazy. You get put away in a mental hospital for a couple years, and when you come out, you're no longer working for the police force, but you're trying to figure out what the fuck you saw. And it takes you to Innsmouth, and you have to go through Innsmouth and deal with all of that shit. And then you leave, and you go back with the military vessels that are going to destroy Innsmouth. And uh, then you get pulled off the boat and you end up in the catacombs underneath. And the whole thing is fucking madness. But for the first... If you were to play it straight through, I'd say for the first hour of the game, you don't even have any weapons. You're just investigating things and trying to figure shit out and trying to fucking survive. And you've got these fishmen coming after you and you got to like run and duck through things and push shit out of the way and like block you know, doors. Yeah. yeah, and it's super intense. And it gets to the point where when you finally get a gun, you get this shitty little pistol. And you're like, oh, I finally have a gun. I can fuck these fuckers up. But they only give you so much ammo. Yeah. And the gun doesn't do much but slow them down. Yeah. So, like, the first guy you get, you're like, ha, 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 bam, 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 you're dead. Oh, fuck, now what do I do? Yeah. So the, the horror isn't just in, in running around. It's in conserving your ammunition. I'm going to check that out. It's, it's in, on Steam. I'm yeah, going to grab it. It's in making things work. And also, there's an insanity system in it. Where if you look at shit that like would drive you crazy for too long, you, you start hallucinating and like you don't know if you're actually being attacked by an enemy 
or if it's just a hallucination as the game starts to progress. Oh, that's cool. So it's true to Lovecraft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they very much did their research on it. Unfortunately, this is another game that was excellent, but the company that made it went out of business. and so they, What's it called again? Uh, Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth. Okay, yeah, I'm definitely going to pick that up tonight. Great game. My number two. I said my number three is more of a sci-fi horror. My number two is more of an action horror. And you may say, oh, that's not horror, but it is. Because it's inspired. It takes a lot from They Live and other movies, such as Army of Darkness, Evil Dead 2. And it has horror elements, hell, crazy monsters, definitely some levels that are very horror-oriented, but Duke Nukem 3D. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'd I consider it a horror game. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a horror comedy action game. But, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. It's one of the best games ever. If I'm going to rip off your head and shit down your neck. The The 20th anniversary is out on Xbox One. You can get it for super cheap, and it includes the whole game, all, all three original episodes, plus the fourth one that you got with the Atomic Edition. Really? And also a new fifth one that was made by the original creators, and the original voice talent comes back as Duke Nukem, and the original music. So the original, yeah, the original nice. people who made everything made another episode recently. <coughs> that's it's awesome. fucking awesome. And it's only like 20 bucks. Nice. That's worth it. It's probably less than that now. When it was brand new, I pre-ordered it, it was 20 bucks. Yeah. And it was awesome. Cool, yeah. I'm a big fan of Duke Nukem. That was, that was one of the first, you know, I mean... Like the first 3D, was it the first full 3D first person shooter? Because Wolfenstein was one of was... them. I mean, it does have sprites that turn and face you and stuff yeah. that aren't really technically 3D. It's more 3D than Wolfenstein, yeah. though. But Duke Nukem, a young JD at the age of 10, on Heat. Remember Heat, the game thing? And Case's Ladder. Remember that shit? No. Dial up. I was number eight in the world. Oh, Duke oh, Duke yeah, Duke. yeah. I know what you're talking the about. Case's yeah. Ladder racing, ranking system. Yeah. Yeah, wow. number eight. Nice. I think I might have got over that. I I don't know. That's what I remember though. Awesome. Yeah, I played the shit out of that game. I, I think I got a bootleg copy from a friend of mine when I was in high school. I would destroy yeah. people at D three D. I'm amazing at it. Hollywood Holocaust. Yeah. <laughs> Strippers and shit. You can pee every time you walk up to the toilet. Yeah. Sometimes I would just pee for like 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, much better. And the fact that he actually rips off the monster's head and shits down its neck. Yeah. He does it. was it. the first game that like really went with like the R rating kind yeah. of thing that I remember, you know? Yeah, for sure. Besides Laser Shoot Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I love those games. Those are fun. Uh, number one. Number one was hard for me. Because... It wasn't hard for me. Yeah, yeah I, I know what yours is going to be. I, mine is... If I'd say a whole series, I would say it's the Silent Hill franchise. But I had to pick my favorite Silent Hill game. And Silent Hill 1 is not my favorite Silent Hill game. Because that game has a lot of flaws. They didn't quite hit their stride with it yet. It was great for its time. There was nothing like it. But Silent Hill 2 through 4 is where it really picked up. And then it was shaky after that. And I'd have to say I think Silent Hill 2 is my favorite horror game because it was the first one that really went into like the psychological depths of what Silent Hill does to people. Yeah. It, it, the first game was about exploring the town of Silent Hill. The third game was about exploring the town of Silent Hill. 2 and 4 was about the psyches of the characters in Silent Hill fucking with them directly. Yeah. And, you know, it introduced all the classic Silent, uh, Silent Hill characters, Pyramid Head and, and the nurses and, you know, all of those, those things that are so, you know intrinsically linked with Silent Hill that have shown up in movies and other games that don't necessarily apply to what's happening in this story. Yeah. Um, but they're so iconic that, that you just can't escape them. Um, and it was just such a great engrossing story and it was one of the first horror games that really, really pulled me in in terms of the story and showing that these games can be used to not just be action and not just be something to like tease your brain and feel, you know, fill out time, but to actually tell you a full story where there's characters that you care about and, like, a reason for things to be happening. And Yeah, they're good. I, I've only played one of them. I think it might have been... It was on PlayStation 2, so what, what is that? Were you a guy or a girl in it? A, a guy. Okay, and you had, like, the You're military... Fighting your guy? daughter. That's the, okay, that's the first one. That's the that's the first one. The first one is you're you're a guy looking for his daughter. The second one is you're a guy who um, euthanized his sick wife uh, by she had cancer and you fucking he he smothered her with a pillow at her request. 
but had so much guilt for it that Silent Hill pulled him in and like fucked with his psyche. The third one you play as the teenage version of the girl that was rescued in the first Silent Hill. Uh huh. And then in the fourth one, you're a guy again, but you're a guy who had whose family had escaped Silent Hill, and Silent Hill was trying to pull you back. Okay. My, yeah, I guess it was number one then, because yeah, it was a, definitely a man trying to find his daughter. Mm-hmm. So. All right, my number one, like you said, in a franchise, I picked one particular game, but all the rest of them are honorable mentions to number one. I have my honorable mentions, but my number one, Doom 2. Yeah. Doom 2 is the best game ever. It's fucking excellent. And there's so many levels. It's, it's totally replayable over and over. Yeah. I've probably played through it maybe 20 times, 30 times in my life. It's fucking madness, too. It's amazing. And just the whole Doom idea, that's a definitely horror first-person yeah. shooter. You know. And Doom 2 is where they hit their stride. Like, Doom, first Doom was awesome because it was the first. Yeah. But... Doom 2, Super Shotgun, baby. Yeah, yeah. That's they, Super uh, Shotgun. Yeah. They pulled it all out. I played the whole game with it. Like I, I'll use yeah. the BFG occasionally and stuff, but I'll super shotgun everything. Yeah, I was doing that in uh, in Xbox One Doom. I, I use that shotgun more than anything else. Yeah, that's the way to go. Yeah. So Doom Two is my favorite Doom. In addition, Doom Final Doom, Doom Three, and the 2016 Doom reboot. I also loved. Yeah. The multiplayer is awesome in that too. I loved the whole reboot, the whole game. It was really great. Like it was better than. I ever thought it was going to be. There's not I'm a so bad, worried it was yeah. going to be horrible, you know. Yeah. Even I have this game on my phone. It's a mobile game called Jump of the Doom. Uh huh. And you spring off things. You're you're the Doom guy, and you spring off little like ledges, almost like Super Mario, but you only can go up. And if you go down, you die. Huh. And you spring on these things. You can jump on explosive barrels that shoot you up in the air. But if you run into like imps or anything or lost souls or any kind of monsters, you die. Nice. And you're just jumping, 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 and I got a pretty impressive high score. Nice. I'm gonna tell you, I've got original Doom on my iPad, like the full game. Yeah, they, that's they, awesome. they made it for it, and also an extra level by American McGee, who I'm gonna talk about later. Um, yeah, yeah, except for some of the like, like the console offshoots, like. I don't. I don't Doom really count 64 those. Doom sixty four is pretty good, actually. Yeah, but so Doom is Duke Nukem sixty four. Yeah, Duke Nukem sixty four has a grenade launcher in addition to a rocket launcher, and it has just different, yeah. a little different things. And even the levels are a little different, but mostly the same. And Doom sixty four is pretty cool yeah. too. But Doom Super Nintendo sucks. Terrible, terrible yeah. game. But in terms of like the core Doom games, whether it's PC or or later the advanced consoles, none of those games are bad. Yeah, any of them you can sit down and play them and enjoy yourself. Yeah, for sure. Even number three. Yeah, three, like, like, it's very horror oriented. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's not as fun of a game to play as Doom Two. Yeah, I've only played it once, and I liked it. Yeah, but I have I won't go back and replay it probably. I, but I played Doom Two fucking thirty times. Yeah. Probably, so. right, well, I think with Doom Three, they were just trying to figure out like the level of what the new technology could do, so that they could bring us Doom for the most recent Doom. Yeah, yeah of, of what we got because that game was mind blowing. Yeah, it's fucking awesome. Yeah. Honorable mentions. I got a bunch. I was actually writing some more down that came to mind while we were talking. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead and go first. All right. I got Castlevania. It's a horror game. Yeah, it is. It's pretty stupid, but it's a horror game. Castlevania Symphony of the Night is a great game, though. Another one, too, that is weird. Like, it's the movie, but it's also a bunch of shit that isn't in the movie. Nightmare on Elm Street, Super Regular Nintendo. Nightmare on Elm Street Nintendo, there's like bats and shit. Oh, yeah, to, yeah. You know? <laughs> and and like, you like go in and out of dreams and stuff. Yeah. yeah. The Darkness 2. Have you played The Darkness or yeah. The Darkness 2? Those are good games. pretty awesome. You're like a mob boss, but you have like, you're possessed yeah. by like, a demon. It's based on a comic book. Oh, really? Yeah. And Mike yeah. Patton from Faith No More and Mr. Bungle does all the monster noises. Really? Yeah. <laughs> the Evil Within. I haven't played that yet. I, I'll let you borrow it. I oh. had it for Xbox One. It cool. was pretty good. It's super frustrating and you die a lot. Mm. Like, I, I don't think I even finished it. I got pretty close, but. I kept. I got to a sticking part where I was just fucking dying. Yeah. You know, because you you can fight some things, but mainly it's like you got to run away. There's some things you can't kill, mm. and you have to get away from. Right. You know? So I like to be able to kill everything and blow everything. Up yeah. And shoot everything. That's my thing. Yeah. You know? Like Doom. Like yeah. that's, that's my ideal game is to where you have to get conserve health and ammo, but destroy. Yeah. You, you, you can't everything. get through the game unless you kill everything. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Left 4 Dead, that was a pretty cool little series. Yeah. Where, you know, where you can be one of the couple characters and fight zombies, but it's all pretty much the same. Yeah. There's like the witch where she's crying and if she sees you, she goes and fucking kills you. Yeah. And there's some cool stuff in there, but not not deserving of the top five. Alien Isolation. 
Have you played it? I haven't played it yet. I want to. It's terrifying. Yeah. Not much happens. It's super boring, still, but still terrifying. That's weird to say, but you go around and not a lot happens. You'll hear little noises. Oh, what the fuck? Yeah. And then the xenomorph will come after you. And it's, it's pretty fucking It's terrifying. realistic is what I understand. It is. It's very <laughs> realistic. Jaws from regular Nintendo. <laughs> that game's terrible. It's not. I, mean, I just love that shit. When I was a kid. It's hard and you yeah, can't beat it. But yeah, it's impossible. Yeah, but I fucking loved that when I was a kid. In the little boat. Altered Beast. Yeah. Rise from game. your grave. <laughs> somewhat of a horror game. Yeah. Zombies Ate My Neighbors. That was a great game. I love that game. Fester's Quest. I, I gave uh, Michelle's kids my NES. I found it in storage and I gave it to them. I have that game still. And it works good? Yeah, it works. That's uh, awesome. And I have Fester's Quest and I went back and I started playing it. The only way you can beat that game is with Game Genie. Yeah, it's so fucking hard. Yeah. So is Beetlejuice. My next round. Yeah, that game's hard as fuck. It's hard. Yeah. It can only be like two levels. Uh, the Walking Dead has the story games mm-hmm. where you have to make decisions and stuff like that. It's like choose your own adventure books and they're actually pretty cool. Really? So I, I enjoyed them. Um, Silent Hill, again. Yep. Mutant League Football. I love that game. <laughs> it's the only sports game I really like other than NCAA Basketball for Super Nintendo. You know, another one that uh, that you need to borrow from me that I have that I could that you can leave with is Dead Rising 3 and 4. Yeah? Great fucking games. I like the originals. I didn't like the first and second one. Mm. 3 and 4 are way better. You combine, you get items and craft them into weapons, yeah. like double items and stuff, and there's these things called psychos. They're like mini bosses. In the map that you can go challenge, there's like a fat lady on a cart. Don't touch my food! Like she's in like one of those handicapped people scooter things. <laughs> a rascal? <laughs> yeah. And she's fucking... Uh, so fun. they're human and you gotta deal with them. Yeah. Yeah, okay. they're psychopaths. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's also a bunch of zombies yeah. and you can combo vehicles together to make cool like a lawnmower, hot dog cart and shit like that. You know? That's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. You can combine weapons and vehicles. And uh, there's just... Badass, like, Asian dude uh, with this... He has... Once you kill him and get his weapon, it's my favorite weapon in the game, but you your weapons turn red and explode if you use them too much. Like, you, your weapons have durability, so you mm-hmm. have to get new weapons, you know? Some of them have ammo, but, like, a sword has durability, but you can have, like, ice sword, flaming sword, electric, like... Okay. A bunch of different... So things. it doesn't take itself seriously. Boxing it's gloves with scissors in them and shit. Like, it's yeah. an awesome fucking... You can get toy bears that have, like, a boombox attached to it that had a machine gun. To where the boombox attracts all the zombies, but then it just fucking explodes or mows them down. That's it's, cool. It's really fun. It's a lot of the same, though. Mm. The game is, like, pretty repetitive. You're doing the same thing for the whole game, basically. Yeah. Besides the psychopaths and little uh, cutaways and things like that and bosses. But, uh... Heretech and Hexen. Yeah. Good games. Great games. Blood. You ever played yeah, Blood? Yeah, Blood. Actually, Blood 2, The Chosen, is the one on my list. Yeah, it's good, too. I, I love the Haunted Carnival on, on that. On that game, that's great. And my last honorable mention: you and your friends are dead. Friday the Thirteenth, regular Nintendo. <laughs> you and your friends are dead. Another impossible game. Yeah, it's fucking hard. I beat it though. Really? It's not impossible. No, you can beat it. It's fucking hard though. It's yeah. super hard. But uh, uh, I, I go back and play it every once in a while, and uh, yeah, it's hard I, like punch outs. Yeah, hard. yeah. You know, it's... you can beat it, but it's fucking hard. Yeah. yeah. It's not Beetlejuice hard, though. No. <laughs> All right. My honorable mentions begin with the Splatterhouse Saga. I've never played that. It came up in my... Because I wasn't a Sega guy. I was a Super uh, Nintendo. Yeah. Well, the original was actually uh, TurboGrafx-16. But I never played any yeah. of those. And I really want to yeah. because I, in my research, I came up with it. Uh, Splat- they're, all, they're all good games. And there's even one for NES that's like a Splatterhouse, like, cutesy chibi game where you're like... It's like a little kid version of Splatterhouse, and that one's fun. Um, Splatterhouse 2 is probably the best one to start with because Splatterhouse 1 has some some glitchiness to it. Uh, But there was also one that they made for Xbox 360 that was a reboot of it that went like into like deep Lovecraftian territory. And it was a third person, you know, where you're running around behind the guy just beating the fuck out of everything. And if you want a game where you got to kill everything, that's the fucking game. Yeah, Dead Rising 3 is third person like that. Yeah. You see your guy. Yeah. I, I prefer first person yeah. to third person. Like I, That's why I didn't like Raising an Eagle that mm-hmm. much, you know? But, uh, yeah, I, I do want to check out that Spider-House. Yeah, I, and you can get uh, all the original games on, like, ROMs and stuff like that. It's all out there. Um, game called Operation Darkness for Xbox 360. It's a uh, turn-based strategy game where you're controlling a squad of soldiers, but... 
uh, it's and it's all um, like British special forces during World War II, but they're all psychics and werewolves and different supernatural things. And you're fighting an army of zombie vampire necro, uh, zombie Nazi necromancers. Uh, zombie Army Trilogy is another game too that's third person, so I didn't enjoy it as much, but uh-huh. it was pretty good. I never heard of that one. It's on Steam. Also. Uh, yeah. So yeah, if you want a game where you gotta strategically kill zombie uh, zombie Nazis, uh, Operation Darkness is a good one. Anytime you're killing Nazis, yeah, it's gonna be. I'm good. down with it. Um, this one is one that I've just started playing, but I'm really enjoying it. It might even make my top five list after I beat it. Uh, Alan Wake. It's like if you if you took Silent Hill and had it written by David Lynch. Yeah. And your main character was basically Stephen King. <laughs> I gotta check that out. Yeah. He's a writer, right? In the yeah. Game? yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's done episodically, so it's like a TV show. And when you, like, every section, like, you beat episode one, and then you get to episode two, and it's like, last time on Alan Wake. And it has a recap of what happened. <laughs> so it's like you're watching a TV show. Um, another one that might act, have actually made my list, had it not been one that I'm still in the, in the middle of playing, is Resident Evil 7. Uh, the one that just came out, they went first person with it. And they totally changed the format on it. It's not a zombie outbreak game. You're this guy who goes to the bayou to find your missing girlfriend. And you end up getting kidnapped by this family of hillbillies that are immortal and have the ability to regenerate as long as they consume human flesh. Whoa, that's and, cool. Yeah, and you know, your girlfriend's there and she's trying to help you. And one of their other daughters is trying to help you it's so far. And then you got to deal with the crazy ass dad and the crazy ass mom who has a like a, a wasp hive in her womb and like shoots wasps at you. <laughs> uh, and I, yeah, and I'm in the middle of a section that plays like House of a Thousand Corpses where their crazy redneck son has set up a game for you, and that's where I am now. But it's all first person, and a lot of it again is is run and hide and wait until you have like your moment, and then you can like if you just jump out and shoot something, you're not going to kill it. Yeah. You got to wait till it's not looking and shoot it in the back of the head. Or, you know, when you fight with the, the dad in the first section of the game, you track him down to a garage, and you finally got a fist fight with him, but the whole point isn't to, like, beat him up, because you can't do that. You have to get into the car that's in the garage and drive spin donuts in the garage to run him over. So you have <laughs> to basically fight past him, and then that ends in, like, a crazy-ass chainsaw duel. Um, it's a lot of fun. That sounds cool. Uh, and I'm not a fan of Resident Evil games, but I'll check that yeah, out. Th- this that sounds more like my speed. Should... I feel like this is almost a game that they made that wasn't supposed to be part of the Resident Evil series, and they just slapped the Resident Evil label on it to get people to play it, but it's better than any Resident Evil game I've ever played, and I liked the first three. Okay. Uh, Another one that I'm currently playing is Outlast. Uh, It is a no-combat game. You're stuck in a mental hospital with these genetically modified crazy patients. That's not my favorite genre. I I don't like when you you can't... Fuck shit up. I want to fuck shit up. Yeah. Everyone's shot them some things. I I get grabbed by these patients and I'm like fumbling the buttons trying to punch them. Yeah. And but I can't. You know, and and it's a very intense game. Uh one of those games I actually break a sweat playing it. So I I can only play it in like sections because I feel like I'm on edge, like I'm gonna have an anxiety attack while I'm which is what they're going for. And the other cool thing about it is you're you're a news reporter in the game and you're trying to uncover what's happening in this mental institution. So your only real tool that you have is your video camera. And you unlock more parts of the game by videotaping things, and you have a infrared light on it. So, like when you get in places where it's dark, you turn on the IR light, and all you have is what's in the view screen of your camera in that sort of off-green night vision kind of thing. And you don't know what's going on, and there's sounds happening everywhere. It's very well made. Um, another game that's sort of like that, made by the people who made the the game that you just plugged, Soma, is Amnesia: The Dark Descent. Uh, that's another one where you can't fight the monster. You just have to run from it, and you can't even look at it because it'll drive you fucking crazy. And uh, it's it's a very scary game. Uh, Fatal Frame, another game where you don't fight. you got to find ghosts and capture them in your camera. And uh, you can hear them, but you can't see them until you're looking through the camera, and then you just have the limit of what's in the camera lens. Oh, okay. While everything else is going on behind you. Can they kill you if you don't have them? Yeah. Camera? Yeah, they can kill you. But you can't see them unless you're looking through the camera. So there might be three ghosts in the room, and you have to capture them in a certain sequence. And so while you're looking at one ghost and trying to photograph it, the other ghost will be somewhere behind you, and you can hear it coming. But you don't know where it's coming from until you turn around. But if the you, camera, like, protects you? Uh, no, the camera lets you see the ghosts and capture the ghosts. When you take your picture, you capture the ghosts. In the oh, film. okay, you have to take your picture. Yeah, that's your only that's weapon. Cool. 
Uh, Siren was made a game made by the creators of Silent Hill when they broke off for a while, and you go to this haunted Japanese village where you know you are just dealing with the people there, and then this crazy siren goes off, and they all turn into these bug-eyed, freaky monsters. Another scary game. Uh, Maniac Mansion for NES. Yeah, that's a good one. One another one of the old school horror games, horror comedy. Uh, the thing for PlayStation, you never know who's infected. You know, I didn't really care for it too much. Really? Yeah, it was cool that they made it so uh-huh. much after the movie. I mm-hmm. really liked that, but I didn't think it was that great of a game. I, I thought it was really smart, especially because it's not like it randomly decides who's infected and who isn't. Yeah. So it's never the same when you play through. And you yeah. might trust someone one game and be able to like have them on your team, but the next game they're not going to be that same person. Yeah. And I thought that was smart. Uh, the first Unreal started out in like the first third of the game was a horror game and then it turned more exploration. Yeah. But it felt, Unreal Tournament is the best. Yeah. I love that game. Uh, games called, the, a series of games, there's two of them called The Suffering. It's like Silent Hill in prison. Okay. Uh, you're, you're this dude who was sent to prison for murdering his wife. You may or may not be guilty of the crime. And how you play the game determines whether or not you're guilty. And some sort of apocalypse situation is happening. So all of the horrors that happened in the prison, and it's like one of the oldest prisons in the United States or something like that, are coming to life. So you have like these, you know, this ghost of an executioner that's trying to kill you. And you have all these these guys called the Needles, who are all the people that died by lethal injection. And they're like monsters made out of syringes. Well, that's and, cool. Yeah, all kinds of fucked up shit happening. And you have to escape from the prison. And then in The Suffering 2, you have escaped from the prison. It basically takes place immediately after the first game. But you go back to New York to try and figure out what happened to your wife. And if you play the games on the same system where it has the same memory, the way you play the Suffering 1 determines how you start the Suffering 2. And then the way you play through that determines in the end whether or not you actually killed your wife. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, very cool shit. And Michael Clark Duncan plays uh, the ultimate bad guy in the end. And it's cool to have him talk shit to you while you're fighting him. <laughs> um, Hotline Miami, game you can get on uh, Steam. Psychological horror, very violent. 8-bit. You're this dude who gets these mysterious messages on your answering machine to go to locations in Florida. It's in the 80s. And you just basically have to go there and murder everyone. And you get these masks that talk to you. Like, it's a bunny mask, and it, like, talks shit to you, and you put it on, and it gives you different powers. But there's no way of telling whether you're, like, schizophrenic, or you might be part of this Illuminati conspiracy. And, uh, it has a lot of really good slasher elements to it, too. Um... And Manhunt. It's like I've never played that. It's like it's like snuff the game. That's awesome. You're you're this dude who was put in prison, and you get jumped into prison and knocked out and taken out to this part of the city where this mysterious person is running this game for some benefactors where they bet, and you have to survive a night. Millimeter the game. Yeah, (laughs) you you have to survive a night in the city. All the gangs are after you, and there are other people that aren't gangs that are after you too. And whoever survives gets to go free. Um, and the whole thing is, is being, you know, shot through CCTV and all that. And there are people, you know, rich people betting on who lives and who dies. That's pretty and cool. And there's like an execution system where you can sneak up on people and kill them with things like fucking shopping bags. You can wrap it around their face and suffocate them. And, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Good shit. Well, you guys, to, to tie this into one of my good movies, after you get these games... Before you play them, you need to watch the movie First Person Shooter. Yeah. FPS. Yeah. Which is horror games way much like Doom has the point. Doom the movie sucks, but has the point where it goes first person for a little bit. The movie First Person Shooter, it's a German movie, you gotta check it out. It it's is all first, first person. person and it is so true to Doom, Duke Nukem, things yeah. like that. It feels and like it you're actually awesome. playing a game. Yeah. And it was way before hardcore fucking Henry. Which I never even saw. I haven't either. Yeah. So awesome. We hope you've enjoyed our top five horror video games. We will be coming back next week with a new top five. I don't know what it is. I don't yet either. We we'll need talk to talk about that, that off there. Yeah. Unless one of you listeners wants to send us an email. Postmortemshow at gmail dot com. Give us your idea for a top five. We will read your list on the air. And as H.P. Lovecraft said, as he took a, a wee whiff of inappropriate sex act bear. <laughs> it smells like fish. Throw the fucker back. To Danny Foster's beard.